I want Hilary Swank in the next Terminator movie so bad. There is nothing in this world that you give me to do to hug a robot. It's because it's so incredible and intricate that it's impossible not to notice. Music's the core of this movie. Born again to watch <laughs> this movie. You'll find redeeming things and you'll be thinking about it for a long time afterwards. There was no bone saw. Just John Hammond it up over here. Two and a half out of three of us recommend it. <laughs> Everybody loves talking about movies. Let's talk about movies. Welcome, everybody, to the Pause, Rewind, Play podcast. I am tonight's showrunner, host, whatever you want to call it, Vince, and I am here with Casey. hey -o. And Josh. How's it going, everybody? Answer the question, I guess, audience. <laughs> <laughs> Crickets. Nobody wanted to respond. Uh, how are you guys doing? How's your week? It's been a good week for me. Been doing a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Oh, Lots of good minus the watching. fact that my dog's ear about got bit off. I just have to bring that up because what a traumatic experience for me. Yeah, poor little June. I love my dog. I hope she's okay. She seems to be doing better. She's running around here earlier. Oh yeah, she's got the tail wag back on. She's just she's just got the cone of shame on for seven days, drugged up for ten. She'll be good afterwards. Oh, did you get an? That's a good excuse to sit on the couch and watch movies. Oh, I watched a lot of Cuddle movies this week, dog. actually. So. What'd you watch? Let's get into it. Okay, so, sorry, Josh, I commandeered this whole moment <laughs> with my dog's ears. He wanted the pity from the audience. I want the pity He lessons. wants that emotional connection. <laughs> so this week, I finally finished Good Omens, which I talked about so much forever. I was like, oh yeah, Good Omens. And then I never finished it. Uh -huh. It was kind of like Chernobyl. I just gave up on it for some reason. But then I actually sat down and... I watched Signs with my wife. We rewatched that, the classic M. Night Shyamalan film with Mel Gibson. I think we might... Have we already talked about this? Like, I feel like I've talked about this with me. I didn't realize he was such a 90s man. Like, I know why he was famous in the 90s, because he was a 90s man. Then he filmed The Passion of Christ, killed it all off. Oh, I thought you were talking about M. Night Shyamalan. No, Mel Gibson. Yeah, he was a 90s guy. Yeah. Even in the 80s a little. Yeah, he was an 80s guy. He's like Bruce Willis. He goes through different decades of film bruce willis is immortal but continues to age yeah he's yeah. good all throughout the years but uh he's not like keanu reeves who doesn't age ever oh anyway what else have you watched keanu <laughs> is so immortal i'm trying to think i like had a brain freeze here oh i watched that film i'm pulling it up right now it's the one where the mom goes to college with her daughter oh gosh hold on here now i feel like a buffoon all right you look that up josh what have you been watching so pretty recently, I've been just chilling a lot, watching a lot of Netflix and boring stuff. I did watch a new Netflix original movie called Triple Frontier, which was... It. You saw it? I did. It was pretty good. Yeah, I liked I it. I liked it. It was pretty good. Um, pretty intriguing. You had Ben Affleck. Yeah. Like, yeah, no, it had Ben Affleck. I can't remember. Uh, I spaced the other guy's name, um, the Spanish guy. I know him because he's in so much stuff. Yeah, he's... Yeah. The cast on it was Wait, great. Wait, what is he in? Star uh, Star Wars, I'm pretty sure. Oh yeah, he's in Rogue One. Oh, he's like the main, oh. the principal. Sorry, um, it's Oscar Isaac. Yes, yeah, the exactly. Doy. Not I'm thinking of um the other guy. Oh yeah, so <laughs> a lot of stuff. Nothing really in particular. I'll be seeing like three movies though this week because I'll be seeing one movie which you know we'll talk about later. I will be seeing The Lion King, just going with my wife because mm -hmm. she wants to, you know mixed reviews there so we'll see how it all goes and then i'm also finally going to go and see yesterday because i've wanted to mm. for a long time but haven't so that's also mixed reviews but we'll go and see if it can build off of the interesting premise it's created yeah i want to see all those movies i think i'll see lion king too but i don't know when did you find your movie life of the party never heard of it no. oh you should watch it yeah. it's a good one it's i got oh my gosh i always hate like butchering who this actress is Ali could tell you right off the top of her head, but it's oh no, it's just gonna start playing. Melissa McCarthy, and she's like essentially. Oh, I do. She I know goes to about. college because her and her husband get divorced, and then stuff happens. That's all I can tell you, really. But that one is one we watched before, and I loved it. It 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 maintained the hype for the second time, so <laughs> it was well, good. What have you been watching, Vince? I actually watched a bunch of stuff this weekend, or this week, I guess. Um, first off, I watched The Hangover. Oh, I watched that too. I forgot. Yeah. Because it's on Netflix now. Yeah, it, exactly. It popped up on Netflix and I was like, hi, it's a Saturday afternoon. I need something just to like kind of turn my brain off. That movie holds up. 
It's still funny. It's so funny. It's got some dated stuff on there, you know, and the soundtrack is the most like mid 2000s soundtrack ever made, <laughs> but it's still such a funny, funny movie. It's too bad Zach Galifianakis can never really get away from being Alan, though, because yeah. he's such a talented actor. But, but... He, that was his like peak role. He was <laughs> so, he's, he makes that movie. It's so funny. I had, to be honest, I had never seen it before, which I know was like crazy, right? The Hangover was one of the biggest things when it came out, but I lived in more of like a conservative household. And they were like, no, you should have watched that. It's bad. And I was like, okay. But then, you know, it shows up on Netflix and I'm like, dude, everyone's watched this movie. I got to watch this movie. I watch it and it blew me out of the water because I was in the same boat. I was just like making dinner and I'm like, you know, turn the TV towards the kitchen, turn it on. And, you know, by the time dinner was ready... It was, hey, let's eat dinner and keep watching this movie because yeah. of how yeah. hilarious it was. It's, and it's one you can just jump in at any moment in the movie and just continue watching it. Yeah. <laughs> so I saw that, and then I also, one of my friends from work invited me to go to a screening of Akira, the anime. I don't know if either of you guys have heard of that one. You mentioned it. Yeah, I invited you guys to go. and uh, We're busy we're like busy. late people. <laughs> so it was an 11 o'clock showing. Um, I'm apparently turning into an old man because 11 o'clock rolled around. I sat down at the theater and immediately started getting real drowsy. And that Akira movie was made in like 88. It looked awesome, but, uh, you have to read the subtitles and Japanese, huh? In Japanese, uh, one of those languages. Oh. So I don't, I'm not really sure, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> but uh, it's it's crazy. It's got some cool action. It's got some awesome animation. It gets kind of wild at the end. And like I said, I was real tired, so I'm I don't really know which of my memories was like actually from the movie and which was an like a fever dream that I made up <laughs> <laughs> from <laughs> from like watching it. But it was cool. I would suggest it if you, especially if you're into anime, it's a must see. I'm not super into anime, so I don't really. You know, it doesn't really connect as well for some reason to me, but I actually really enjoyed it. I said I'd recommend to see it again. And that setting that I was watching it in, even though I was real sleepy, like it was just tons of anime fans and they were cheering and they were super excited and it made it that much better for me. So if you ever get, if you're ever interested, it, it's got a lot of, um, like it, it, like sci fi pulls from it a lot. Like it's one of those, um, inspirational type movies for the genre so it sense. really inspired yeah it's the, what came out afterwards exactly what's that word they use like a thing that was that like it's a pivotal pivotal type thing where yeah. it like opened up more options right mm -hmm. okay so yeah anything else you guys saw you want to talk about today i i mean literally right before we started recording i watched the trailer for uh once you be my neighbor oh what'd you think i didn't tom watch hanks it. i watched it was really good and people who are talking about it with, you know, the people who know stuff about it are saying that it's going to be amazing, you know, because it, before I watched this trailer and read the things that are coming out about it, it would not be in my top 10, like, movies I'm excited for for the mm -hmm. rest of the year. And while it definitely doesn't jump up to number one or anything, it's, you know, definitely made the list now. I mean, Tom Hanks, he looks the part, you know, when they get him all in the makeup and everything. And he also, when now seeing the trailer and seeing not just a picture of him, seeing how he acts, it's pretty obvious that he is not, you know, Mr. Rogers from the voice perspective, but from the acting perspective, it's like I was taken aback. You know, I, yeah. I don't know about you guys. I grew up watching Mr. Rogers, and so I have a feeling it's something that I'm going to go watch, you know, and probably ball my eyes out or something. <laughs> I don't know. I saw this uh, thing on The Onion the other day that said Tom Hanks will not stop until he's portrayed every last American in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved it so much. But I, I saw that earlier today, actually, and I loved it. I was pretty excited about it. I think that Mr. Rogers, kind of like he was a very, I don't know, he was a person who wanted the world to be better than it was. And he taught a lot of simple life lessons that helped the world out. So I'm excited for that. But... Other than that, I started watching something called The Last Days of the Romanovs or The Last of the Romanovs, which is or The Last of the Tsars or whatever, which is talking about the end of the Romanov dynasty in Russia, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's like more of like a historical drama, just kind of like all about there. But it didn't really catch my eye, but it was very informative. And I, I would say if you're like kind of a geek like me and want to like learn about history, that works, but nothing cool. else. Cool. 
All right, well, let's jump into Looper then. Looper was made clear back in 2012, release date of September 28th, um, Directed and written and directed by Ryan Johnson. It had a budget of $30 million, and it ended up grossing $176.5 million. The Rotten Tomatoes score, uh, the critics gave it 93%, and the audience gave it 82%. It has a meta, score, a meta score of 84, and IMDb gave it 7.4 out of 10. It is starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt as Joe, Bruce Willis as Old Joe, Emily Blunt, Pierce Gagnon, Jeff Daniels, Piper Parabo, Paul Dan, Paul Danny, and Noah Segan. And I might have again. I'm not very. I'm known to not pronounce names very well. So if I pronounce any of those names, I'm sorry. But the cast was phenomenal as well. So what did you guys think? Did you like it? Was I? Was it a good recommendation on my part? It was definitely a good recommendation after seeing it because i had seen like barely any of it and then for some reason i had to go and so i never finished it but i remember when it first came out being extremely excited because of the premise i mean some guy meeting his future self and then like fighting people together and the two people are bruce willis and joseph gordon levitt like that's gotta be the coolest thing ever and so it was crazy that i had never seen it until now and you know watching it and the way they set up everything, and then the way they finish it, especially for me, um, I definitely enjoyed it and would recommend it. Yes, I, too, loved it. I thought that yes. it was a very well-thought-out film. I've been hesitant to watch it because I just didn't want to be disappointed, right? I read about it, and I I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. Because especially with, and we're talking about this, time travel films, it's either like a real hit or like a huge whoopee cushion bust. It is just not great. Mm-hmm. And and this one, I feel like it, it was a bullseye for me. But there are a few things I, I could talk about that I was like, eh, that's weird, but... Yeah, we'll get into it. <laughs> I love Looper. Uh, I am a huge Bruce Willis fan. He's one of my favorite action heroes, if not my favorite action hero. I used to tell my friends when I was younger that I wish I could grow up to be Bruce Willis. I love Die Hard the fifth element i grew up on i know he's done a lot of crappy movies just to get a paycheck but the movies where he's good in it 12 monkeys just he's so good in them the sixth sense one of my favorites to go back to Shyamalan. Uh uh-huh and uh this isn't his first foray into time travel either what was the one you brought up the other day uh the kid right the kid oh yeah it's a time travel movie technically whoa that's weird Uh i didn't think about that 12 monkeys another time travel movie and then this one looper is another time travel movie what if bruce willis is a time traveling monk and we just don't know it (laughs) and he picked up acting to support his time travel (laughs) i'm sorry and now he goes around and supports these time travel films just to keep it in our minds that it's not real so people won't get uh, a misdirection (laughs) man That's that's why war is so popular because war's out there, but we don't know what wars are going on. Sorry. Yeah. Well, now I'm just gonna be weird and thinking about you know old Bruce Willis with Joseph Gordon Levitt, but then like way back then the younger ish Bruce Willis in the kid, he's like still forty or something with huh. the kid kid who's supposed to be Bruce Willis. It's like the same thing except for obviously it's completely different stories, but it's like the second movie where it's literally just him with himself it's as the main yeah. actors in a movie. <laughs> It's crazy. not his first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just one last cool thing that uh, that we'll, we'll get some other cool stuff as we as we kind of talk about the movie. But um, just to talk about the script a little bit that Ryan Johnson wrote, he actually came up with this I, the idea for the, for Looper years and years ago. Um, I think he said it was like two thousand four, two thousand two thousand three, like yeah, two thousand three. It was right after they finished Brick. Yeah, yeah. Him and so Joseph he he had been working with Joseph Gordon Levitt, but he even before they did Brick he had written a short story that was Looper. He had no intention of making it into a big feature film until he started pitching ideas with Joseph Gordon-Levitt. They came up with some stuff, and he ended up writing it specifically for Joseph Gordon-Levitt to play Joe in the role. Then after they started going, they started looking for bigger-named actors that they could tie to it. They sent the script to Bruce Willis, who read it and immediately said, yes, I want to do this movie. And they also sent it to Emily Blunt, who got halfway through the script, didn't even get to her part in the script before she said, yes, I'm going to do this movie. She didn't even know what she's going to play. So that's that's the testament to how strong this and unique this idea is. Emily Blunt could have been a salamander for all she knew and been in this film. 
Yep. I've just been perfectly happy to be a part of it. <laughs> Sorry. Well, they were so surprised. I was watching an interview with Ryan Johnson and Joseph Gordon-Levitt that they did, and he said that he they were so surprised because they sent it to Bruce Willis before everyone. They had their list, and they threw Bruce Willis out there as their like you know dream actor for uh-huh. the role. Right? They weren't thinking about that they look the same. They weren't thinking about anything like that. Their director said Bruce Willis would be great for this role. And so they sent it as like a dream. And then, like you said, he immediately accepted. And they were like, oh man, like this is going to happen. This is going to be obviously. They said that they still made it feel because it was Joseph Gordon Levitt and Ryan Johnson, a lot of people who had worked on Brick together. It was going to feel like a little like home passionate movie that's made like not as a blockbuster but with a lot more effects and a lot more big cameras and production like a blockbuster movie and you can Mm -hmm. sort of feel that watching the movie that even though it is a big blockbuster it doesn't feel like that all the time it's kind of indie-ish almost kind of small so they casted bruce willis they had joseph gordon levitt supposed to play his younger self and then they had the challenge of hey we got to make these guys look similar right did you say you looked up some stuff about like how they ended up I hated that so much. That was my biggest hate of the film. Once he, once Josh like pointed it out when we were watching it, I was so distracted. That's why I had to watch it twice. You didn't like the prosthetics that they attempted to make him look like Bruce Willis. He almost looked like Red Skull. <laughs> That's how I felt. But no, like they did a lot of work. So Joseph Gordon Levitt had to spend like about three and a half, four hours a day in the makeup chair just to get those features down, and then he had to also do the mannerisms of bruce willis to kind of make it so that it was consistent because right like for an old actor it's like teaching an old dog new tricks right it's harder to play a younger actor and their mannerisms whereas a younger actor is always like game to learn from the old dog so i'm not saying that bruce willis is old dog but just that's the metaphor i use but but he is though he is he's like the eternally old dog but like we mentioned before he's also you know spanning generations with the films yeah. that he's in and everything Timeless. he's doing yeah but yeah so it was just a lot of time and practice to get to where he could act and be where he need to be to look similar to old joe because he's never gonna look exactly like bruce willis so he kind of made up for it in those mannerisms yeah see for me it's not worth it like for me personally they did they had so much time that went into the makeup and i could see it when we looked like especially at the diner scene it shows them from the side you you can clearly see where they've like pumped out joseph gordon levitt's nose and because that was the first part where i was actually like the whole beginning of the movie i was like this feels weird like why does joseph gordon look weird Uh because i didn't know that they had done stuff to him which i guess is good because then you know you're expecting something different but And then I was like, he just looks weird. Like, what's going on? And then I'm like, oh, they changed him to try and look like Bruce Willis. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know it. And for me, it was just more of a distraction rather than, hey, they did a really good job making him look like him because they just, they don't really look alike. And for me, I know that they did those things to make them look like that. And if they hadn't, they probably would have gotten a lot of slack from it just saying, yo, these guys don't look like the same at all. For me, it's just not worth it to put that much time and effort to it. It's something that for me was distracting rather than, enhancing to the story yeah. for me you have two really good actors let them go out there by themselves do their thing let mannerisms and other things make up for what they lack in physical similarities see i didn't have as much of a problem with it as you guys did and i actually found myself after the two hours of watching the movie um i jumped into the bonus features and started watching interviews with joseph, Go- joseph gordon levitt and i actually in my mind had to like rewrap my rewrap my mind around like what he really looks like versus the joseph gordon levitt levitt that i'd been staring at for the two hours of the movie and i almost like it was jarring like after watching him for so long and then seeing what he really looks like it almost felt like a different person you know it's like oh you look kind of weird because i was so used to the prosthetics on him so i don't know i was i was okay with it at the very least they had to have the eyes be the same because there's that close-up shot in the movie where they have bruce willis's eyes and it transitions transitions over to jg L's eyes and they have the same colors and everything but yeah it, it was probably a little overkill see i agree that's like a okay fix though you can have yeah. an actor throw on some put context. in contacts in 10 seconds you mm-hmm. know versus like casey said three to four hours in a makeup chair every day but i mean all things aside they did it 
And Joseph Gordon-Levitt, he spent a lot of time researching Bruce Willis and his roles in movies. He said he focused more on more recent movies by Bruce Willis because he didn't so much want to look like a young Bruce Willis because he doesn't look like that. He wanted to mimic some of the mannerisms of Bruce Willis now so that it could be seen in the movie yeah. that they do some and of the And even Bruce things. Willis said that. Like, he, Joseph Gordon-Levitt said he was in the diner scene or one of the scenes. He said in, after one of the takes, he kind of... Bruce Willis kind of leaned back and he's just like, you act like me or something like that. I can't remember exactly what he said. And <laughs> Joseph Gordon-Levitt was like pumped about it. He's like, yes, I did it. I did yes. it. So yeah, anyway, let's jump into the, the world of Looper. Let's jump into the story here and uh, kind of explore this film a little bit. So is this a, a spoiler alert zone? Yes. Spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler alert. So I can take <laughs> off? I can talk about some crazy stuff? Yep. It's If you haven't seen the movie, go watch it. If you want to be spoiled and you don't really care to see it, continue on. If you've seen the movie, here we go. I, By the way, just going forward, I would recommend this movie. I was very hesitant to watch it, and I'm glad I did. So, really, I'm if I don't want to see a movie, like, I really wanted to see, oh gosh, Aquaman. But I was afraid to go see it in the theaters based off what everyone said. And I barely saw it, like, three months ago. And that's, like, a year later, yeah. so... It's just taking me since 2012 or whatever, but now I watched it and I love it. Um, can I kind of set up the world kind of we're sitting in? Yeah, yeah. Okay, the Looper world is kind of a really interesting place. It takes it takes place around 2044. Um, there are these like contract killers, essentially. That's what these guys are. And they have blunderbusses. I love the name of this gun, by the way, a blunderbuss. I think it's based off of like an actual historical gun, like a uh-huh. musket type device. But these guys are like present day contract killers. So essentially their job is because time travel exists as we've kind of alluded to, these guys have like a specific spot that they have to go to where they've been contracted. Whatever comes through that hole, you kill and you shoot. And what's interesting is these when these people arrive, they're facing the assassin, one pump shot to the head, shoulder, chest area. And then on the back of these guys, they got some payday gold silver whatever they get i guess they don't get gold until kind of later but yeah so you gotta explain like where these people are actually coming from too oh these people are coming from 30 years in the future where time travel is real outlawed. yeah yeah real and outlawed. it's real but outlawed and only criminals use it and what's kind of interesting about this film too sorry to kind of bounce around a little bit this time is it set in the Midwest? And that was kind of weird because you don't really see that many films set in the Midwest. It's becoming a little bit more prevalent. But since kind of everyone moved west and back to the coast, we don't really see that much. A lot of those cities get kind of missed out. And I think it's cool to kind of have that experience to do so. But these contract killers, they're kind of managed by a guy who is from the future, um, who is, oh gosh, what's his name? Jeff Daniels, who I thought. <laughs> I thought of him as a guy from Dumb and Dumber the whole time. Um, he just hasn't left that. This for is him. Harry's future job is yeah. to run this this mob. So after Harry, you know, gets they separate for good, they they go their separate ways. In the future, he gets sent back to the past to run a gang. But yeah, then kind of there's this special skill that a lot of people develop. It's more of a like a mutated gene, rise, right, What they called it. It's what called TK something. Yeah, TK. TK and they can so most people can only do like quarters nickels stuff like that that has a specific metal in it so they'll, they'll actually like float it above their hands they can like control things with their minds yeah they're almost like x-men but not yeah um so they're this actually reminded me of a thing i just forgot about it but crap what's it called it's a book series where the sun changes and everyone gets superpowers um so i thought about that quite a bit through this but they were like less likely so yeah that's kind of the premise i guess that good enough yeah i could go on about it most of it so for the the tk part of it what i thought was interesting and actually ended up being a good thing because like two-thirds of the way through the movie they there was another little tk thing and i was like this is useless like the way they set this up and put it in the movie like this is so dumb and unnecessary because it really is it's not even just like that they float coder that they float quarters above their hands it's that's all they do like it's that's like a, the it's like a party trick exactly and that's the only thing that these people with telekinesis can do and it gets to one point where like they sort of made it a little bit bigger because joseph gordon i was like well that's pretty cool is that emily blunt's character is floating like a lighter in her hand 
but that's like the biggest thing that anyone can do. And I'm like, this is so pointless, obviously in the finale of the movie that changes for a, you know, a really big cause and a really big thing. And so I like that they set it up like that. And it's like, Hey, telekinesis is a thing. So it's not just all of a sudden like yeah, this big kid. telekinesis <laughs> that the kid, you know, not to jump there, we'll get to it, but that the kid can do it, but they set it up in a really smart way mm-hmm. that sets it up that it's there. So you're like, okay, and it's not just like this random, all of a sudden there's superpowers in the world, but that yeah. sets up in a really smart and subtle way for the end. Yeah. And we kind of get in the beginning of the movie, kind of they're they're running around the city, like you said, they're contract killers. They're they're getting these guys sent back to, from the future to kill, and you kind of get a feeling of what this mid midwestern city is and what the world kind of is in general. And it's kind of gone to crap. Like the city is dirty. It's like everyone takes the law into their own hands. You see one guy steal something from another guy and he just pulls out a shotgun and shoots him dead in the street oh, yeah. there's like random kids that are like starving and have nothing and even um young joe his character came from the streets like his mother abandoned him or something i can't remember what happened to her yeah that's his backstory his mother abandoned him and he kind of was left to fend for himself he grew up in some part of town he says and yeah and he ended up standing up a a watch it was a storefront for they were selling watches and uh uh, Jeff Daniels' character, um, I'm spacing Abe. his Abe, Abe, recognized his talent. It's kind of a baby driver situation going on, recognizes this kid, the potential of this kid, and he ends up recruiting him as a looper, and he says he's the youngest looper out of any of them that he's ever recruited, and they make jokes about how small he was carrying his blunderbuss around. <laughs> but like, I, I was watching this scene, I was like, well, no wonder people want are so okay with this job. Because the alternative is just the worst life you can get. They they never showed, except for with Emily Blunt's character out in the running the farm. There's no middle class. There is either you're living on the streets or you're killing people and you're making bank and you're doing drugs and partying. And so it's like, what out of those two would you just would you want to do? Would you want to have money or do you want to live in poverty? I pick the murdering and the drugs <laughs> and the partying. <laughs> I definitely love that. That's something like you mentioned that I was thinking about because Ryan Johnson said it himself that this movie is based and the premise of complete society is it's pretty much in ruin. And like you said, there is no middle class. There's the up, there's the down, there's nothing in the middle. So as sad as it is, you know, this isn't like the worst thing that you could be doing. Like Casey said, in all reality, even though it's like a horrible thing, you would much rather be killing people than you could literally almost just get shot in the street for touching somebody's like bike and the law, like if there even is law anymore would pretty much do nothing about Mm -hmm. it. You know, we see that in the future, they probably get a little bit more control on things since they said like, it's impossible to hide a body in the future. And yeah, it makes sense that they go the opposite of being like complete Western society to an over uh, overbearing government. Because in, in, even in the, I was reading some of the the rules of time travel and the, the bonus stuff that Ryan Johnson came out with, and he actually said that the reason that they can't dispose of the bodies in the future, one of the plot holes of people like being like, why don't the mob just, just throw them in the furnace in the future, is because people actually have in their bloodstreams ways for the government to track you. And so it it's all based on like heat. So they're not constantly watching you, but if like your body goes cold, then it sets off an alarm in the computer system and they can track your body and they can find you and figure out what happened to you. So there's no way, literally no way you can get rid of a body anymore. And that's why they have to dump them in the time machine, send them back in time to before the government was tracking everybody and they can get rid of the body that technically never existed in the past. Nice. Sorry to interrupt you. (laughs) No, that was perfect. That's all I was saying is that there's, you know, that's a really smart thing. I hadn't thought of that. Well, I actually will say that I had thought of that, not like as a plot hole, just as like a quick thought as they're saying it. It's impossible to dispose of a body in the future. Mm -hmm. And just as I was watching, you know, just a quick little, you know, why flash across my mind, but I didn't really think any more of it. Something that I will say as far as the introduction goes, I was really cool with it. It was a good way to set up um, everything with Joseph Gordon-Levitt narrating and giving us the basic plot points for uh, how this movie was going to go down. For me, it, it did get to a point where it was excessive though because I liked it because especially the end where he narrates you know the finale it gives it a good arc and a good close 
but it's just like him explaining every single little thing instead of just letting the audience like sort of figuring it out like for me it was getting a little bit old but it still wasn't bad but then the moment where he was like this is called closing your loop i was like hey this is like the seventh time he said something like in the intro like it's i get it it's okay (laughs) just have like a character like a few characters mentioned oh he closed his loop like something like that instead of the continuous narration small nitpick i don't have a ton of nitpicks i have like an okay amount that was i think one of my bigger ones because i was also like casey a little bit skeptical for the movie and it ended up really really good for me this was one of the only points at the beginning where i was like okay like do i like this movie this is a little (laughs) bit annoying so well it's kind of it's kind of interesting because there's that fine line right between characters introducing the film and us just experiencing the film as it goes and this one really it it crossed the line a little bit for me as far as it goes similar to josh but i found it very interesting it's a cultural setup in a way of the society that they live in, right? We do things and they're very normal to us and kind of our flow of our day. And that's just how it is here in the States or, you know, wherever you might be listening from, you know, you all have different ways of doing things and that's normal for you. But we had to kind of break into this. I don't know if you, it was a little bit of a dystopian society type thing. We had to kind of understand the rules. And I think that's why they went into such a long portrayal of it. And I felt that once he finally described, like, that's closing your loop, and then everyone else but him closing their loop kind of set up for, like, oh, crap, what's happening? Why is he the last one? And it kind of breaks into it that he kind of had went somewhere, you know, and went off the grid a little bit. But still, it it was a good setup, but a little bit long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really cool. So, so closing your loop, if we – I don't know if we really went into it, but closing your loop is basically if you're a looper – you kill people for the mob up until you end up killing yourself. That's closing your loop. Is the mob will send your old body, your 30 year older body person, whatever, back in time. You kill yourself, you get a fat paycheck, and you get to live the next 30 years of your life up until you become that person who gets sent back to be killed. Yeah. So they're, they're recruiting, recruiting all these people, and, and that way they can kind of close that loop, and, and you're just done with, you know never have to be worried about again right yeah and that's kind of where where the the problem of the movie starts to happen is joe young joe's friend fails to close his loop he uh his older self shows up and he's singing a song that the his friend recognizes when he's a kid and the kid doesn't have it in him to kill his older self so he starts talking to him he starts learning about the future he learns about the rainmaker that will come It'll be an important aspect of the Guy movie. Guy throwing out lots of money, making it rain. <laughs> Close. <laughs> the rain is actually death. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, I was like, he's making it rain bodies. Because <laughs> I say he's closing all the loops and everything, yeah. right? That's what the Rainmaker is doing. Sorry. Keep yeah, and, and that's what he, he talks about. He says that there is a the, this Rainmaker that is closing everybody's loop, and he, he has basically taken over the mob in the future and and... The rumor is he single-handedly took over, took out the mob all by himself. So he's like this this myth that they're only hearing whispers of because of these people that are that kind of come back. But one of my favorite scenes in the movie is after Joe's young friend. Joe's friend comes yeah. back and he fails to close his loop. His older self tries to get away, tries to survive, and we kind of see the the consequences of that through through this character. And it's terrifying. Like, oh, the, man. the it, guy's running away. Go ahead. It's such an interesting thought because as you watch it, you're like, whoa. Like, even if you're good enough to get away, like, you're not safe. Because as weird as it is, you're not the only one that you have to worry about. You know, you have to worry about you and yourself from 30 years ago. Because if they've got him, like, you're screwed. You're just the later version of him. Yeah, this is one where you, you need... To remember that your actions now and in the will determine some of your actions or some of the things happen to you in the future so the younger version of this guy gets captured beaten up and slowly but surely gets butchered and this old guy is like running away and what what goes missing first like fingers right like one well there's like a there's a message on his arm that scars into his arm and then one by one his fingers start to disappear and then his nose, and then he like 
runs back to where he needs to be and as he like finally gets there like what do we get down to he's like nothing yeah that's so that was the scariest part for me is he's like running down the street and then his leg just disappears and he collapses onto the ground because they're like removing piece by piece of this guy and so his future self is just slowly disappearing from existence it's terrifying (laughs) but it, it kind of and maybe we can go into the rules of time travel here a little bit more. It kind of establishes the that that in this movie it's not like Endgame where time travel, what you do in the past doesn't matter. You just there's only you go back and fix it or whatever. In this one, it's like you go back in time, you change something, it affects everything. So in that idea, like every time the mob sends someone back in time, they're changing the future. And this kid who's running around. I guess he's the old older version of himself. Every time he gets a piece chopped off of him, that's 30 years that he had to live without that piece of his body. And so every time he gets a piece chopped off of him, that's a change of his future, right? So, so that's where like my nitpick of this scene comes in because if you just take it at face value, it really is a chilling scene. And so for a second when I was watching this, I started to think about it a little deeper. And then I was like, no, scale it back. Like, it's an intense part. Like, think about it later. So if you just take it at face value, it's super chilling, super crazy. And it uh-huh. still is chilling, you know, just to think about that, living it with it like that way. But one of the time travel things that for me just goes a little bit too far that they just don't look at is these characters as they have the messages scarred into their arms and their fingers disappear and stuff. They look at it. And it's like it's happening to them right now. And they're like, oh, whoa, like, look at this stuff that's happening to me. And they're not treating it as it would really have been that they would have lived this way for 30 years before they came back. Well, they kind of go into that with young Joe and old Joe, right? Because what old Joe has to do is he'll sit there and he'll think about something like and it like plays in his mind, right? Like, what is young Joe doing right now type thing, maybe? And it plays through his mind. And then there's one scene essentially where old Joe is sitting there after he comes back and he's, he's like, he experienced something where this, you know, young Joe is getting like hit, I think, or maybe they're like getting it on. I can't remember what segment we're at already, but he's like, I need to remember his wife's face. Right. And he has to like really like fight it that that reality still exists. And so I think the thing is, is in the heat of the moment, these bodies in the heat of the moment, these bodies and these people they're not thinking about what happened to me historically because like you and I, I can't remember every time I ever bought an ice cream cone from an ice cream truck. But if I think about it, I can remember it. So these guys have to put some thought into those memories because sure, oh, I got this cut. They could probably take a moment and think about it and remember that horrific experience. Well, that's that's kind of what happens in the diner scene. So um, so basically what happens is uh, Joseph Gordon, young Joe, ends up closing he was supposed to close his loop old joe comes back he fails to kill himself old joe starts to go on a uh you don't really know what he's going what he's doing right then but he starts to run around and tells his young self to disappear yeah Um, it's a treasure hunt yeah real quick old joe makes a super dope move where he flips around to make the gold you know block young joe from killing himself and then yeah chucks them uh, just to throw like just, a quick little like that was a cool action shot stuff that and he, then he did. just kind of like left yeah. hooks him right in the face and knocks him out for the rest of the day well each of these bodies i don't know if we've outlined it very well each of these bodies have come through with like a with like silver bars on their back and when you close your loop the body comes through with gold bars on their back and that's how you know that it's you because these bodies come through they're in a gray in a brown jacket with a white sack over their head and they're tied in this case, when old Joe arrives and Joe, young Joe is supposed to close his loop, he comes, his arms are out, and he's not wearing mm-hmm. the thing. And so he flips around so that the gold is, you know, what gets shot. And then he grabs a bar of gold and, like, throws it at him to distract him, then socks him and gives him a him cold out. one. So that that's just something so that, cool. that was really cool. It's so cool. <laughs> Anyways, quick shout out to that action moment. <laughs> yeah. Continue with the yeah. story. Man. So anyway, so they, they get together after a bunch of stuff ends up happening. They finally sit down together in this diner and they start to talk about time travel and the effects of time travel and how it works. And Bruce Willis has this awesome line where he's like, it doesn't matter. We can sit here all day talking about this and it, it won't make sense. Even Abe has a, 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 a line about time travel earlier that's like, if you think about time travel too much, you'll scramble your mind or something like that. Yeah. It's like for this movie, they're basically telling you for this movie, just don't 
think about it too deep. Take the story for what it is. But when they're sitting there in that diner talking to each other, they bring up memories and how that affects them. Because he asks him, he's like, okay, if I scar myself, if I hurt myself or cut myself, it shows up on your body. How does that work with, with your memory? Have you done this before? Have you seen this? Am, am I just playing out the other end of what you've already experienced? And he's like, no, that's not how it is. He's like, it's cloudy for me. He's like, I remember everything you do right after you do it, but I've never experienced this before. And so this is why he's so worried, and we need to get into old Joe's storyline because this is a really important part of it. But everything that happens to well, – the longer the old Joe is in the past, the more his memories – start to become more and more cloudy and foggy and so he's starting to forget his whole 30 years of life life that he's experienced because this new timeline is now forming and so in my in my understanding of this time travel mechanism is that as the longer he's there the more his body and his mind adapts to this new timeline but it's not an instant thing where he's just like nope this is the new thing he just his body has to acclimate to it yeah, going into Old Joe's timeline a little bit here, right? So there is a timeline where Young Joe just kills Old Joe. And this is so cool how they do this, sorry. Yeah, the way that they play this out is incredibly well thought out and just well done. Old Joe gets killed. Young Joe goes on living the next 30 years, right? And what he does is he wants to go to Paris originally, you know, to go to France and go taste the cheeses and whatever <laughs> and the ducks. And then he ends up going to China and he kind of like lives out this life as like a druggy hitman pimp. I don't know whatever he is back there, right? And then he runs into this this beautiful woman and ends up like <laughs> this is like the best thing. The very first thing, like he kind of like makes the eyes to her, kind of gives her a thing, and she just like lifts up the bird and it's like <laughs> you're done, bud. And then you know they kind of like get married and kind of their lives go on. And so old Joe has like lived his life. He killed his loop in his timeline. And so him now coming back is like scrambling everything so much that it's going to cause a whirlwind of fun. Well, because him coming back the way he does, as weird as it sounds, like he doesn't know that he'll, he does know that he'll be messing up his timeline because in his timeline, right, his beautiful wife that he's had, that he met, like Casey said, and they got married and they're enjoying this perfect life gets killed in front of him before the people take him back and so what he wants to do is he does want to change the past because he wants something to happen to stop this rainmaker because the rainmaker kills his wife and so even though back then when he was a looper he knew that he would have his 30 years since he's found someone to share it with and he wants to stay with them he doesn't want that's not good enough for him anymore he wants to change it and so he goes back right right before they put him in the time machine or whatever it is. He fights off his guards and he goes back the different way so that hopefully to him, hopefully he'll, what is our main storyline, he'll change young Joe's view and be able to change the future, which is sort of what ignites the entire, the main controversy of the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry to interject here. A couple days before old Joe goes back in time and all of this happens, he gets a... A very like wild phone call from one of his old looper buddies it looks like and he gives him like a series of numbers that he's not quite i don't know we're not quite sure about he probably knows but when he goes back he selects from like this database of births or lives or whatever three different identities which could be the person who is the rainmaker and that's where he kind of goes off on his little treasure hunt you might say to locate the rainmaker in the past I don't know if that was a weird interjection or not, but no, no, it, it's part. It's an important part of the story. It's, it's a, what gets us to farm out, yeah. and you actually get to meet Sid and Emily Blunt. Why can't I remember Sarah? Sarah. Sarah. Yep. Real quick though, I want to talk about Joe as a character. What are his real motivations in this story? Like he says that he's doing these things to to stop the rainmaker to to make for a better future, but you really do you really think that's what he is, or do you think it's more like? personally motivated are we talking about old joe or both joes old joe i guess they're separate characters at this point old joe is completely motivated by wanting to keep his wife for me because he does what he knows is the unthinkable and killing what he learns to be innocent children if you're trying to get a better future i understand like 
to sacrifice a few for the greater good, you know that he would find a smarter way to figure out that rather than he's just like, I want my wife back. We want to do it. He's like, there's these three kids. It's one of them. He's like, I've killed tons of people in my day as a looper. Like, let's just make it happen so that I can stay with my wife. That's for me. And that's for me. I don't know if that was like setting it up the whole time. That's like a big, a big twist, you know, when all of a sudden, you know, old Joe is the bad guy. Cause at first he comes back, you know, and they're talking about what's happening. He's like, you need to go and keep our life together in the future so we can meet this lady. And so I'm like, Oh, they're going to like work together. Like I thought when I watched the commercials for the movie, but then when he turns to this bat, all he wants to do is kill these three kids to make sure the rainmaker never exists in the future. I was like pretty surprised. I was like, Whoa, that's like a kind of weird twist thing that you throw Bruce Willis on the lower end of the stick. Yeah. That's, that's what's wild is he is just, he's not excusing himself from being a murderer. And it's kind of wild that he just doesn't care. Like he has this vision and I'm, I'm like curious about his plan to go back. How is he going to go back to the future? We don't have a well, DeLorean in this film. That's actually one of Ryan Johnson's rules of time travel. There's no way back. There's no way you back. You can only travel back in time. Oh, so. All right. he, he actually, there's a photo online and in the bonus features that you can look at that has the Ryan Johnson rules of time travel, which are one, time travel cannot be adjusted. Time travel is a one-way ticket. Both versions of you can exist. Time travel is illegal. You can communicate across time by like scarring yourself and that kind of stuff. And the future has in infinite possibilities. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I now know it's a one-way ticket. But, well, that's what's weird, though, is if he's going to go back, he's created now a split in the time continuum where he has, like, left his – like, his wife is dead, right? But he's gone. What does he think is going to happen if he kills Rainmaker? Is he just going to dissipate back to his timeline? Never – like, the death never happened? Yeah, I think – Like, that's a, that's a good hope, but I don't think it was going to be the thing that really happens. So that's how I read it too. The first few times I saw it mm -hmm. was that he was this kind of like hero character that was willing to do the hard thing because he felt like it benefited him and it would save the world. But after watching it the, again and more with a more critical eye, I kind of agree with, with you guys, with Josh. Like, I don't, I don't think he's doing these, this for the right reason. And it made the scene where he actually goes and kills the kids just completely different in my mind. Because the first few times I saw it, he kills those kids. He walks out and he just breaks down into tears. And the first time I, or the first few times I thought like, oh, he's sad he had to kill this kid and it didn't work out. But I agree with you. I think that in his mind, I agree with you, Casey. I think in his mind that he fully expects that if he kills this kid, he'll get what he wants mm -hmm. to be back with his wife. And the reason that he breaks down crying is because it didn't work and he only has two more chances for it to happen. Yeah. And it makes him like a bad, kind of a really self-centered like guy, like bad guy in a way. So for me, it's, I think that it's probably a little bit of both because I hadn't thought about it that way that you just explained. Um, I think he does still cry a little bit because he killed an innocent kid because while he does, while he is really selfish in his intentions in my eye, I think that he's still human enough to know i just killed an innocent child like changed this family's future yeah. but i also agree like thinking about it now that it's like that i i just have a hard time with this movie's time travel yeah because that's a huge huge paradox if bruce willis comes back and he doesn't right he doesn't end up killing the kid if bruce willis comes back and he kills the kid how would that happen in the future? Because the Rainmaker wouldn't exist in the future, so why would future Bruce Willis come back to kill the kid? Well, that's just a split in reality is all it's going to end up being. It's just that's, like, it's in this timeline it has to happen, but in another timeline it didn't. If there are infinite timelines, it one timeline there's, it didn't There's happen. one timeline, right? But there's infinite possibilities for the timeline. So yeah. every time someone gets changed back, the timeline is altered. Well... But so that's my thing, not to interject, is that he, if he kills the kid and then the Rainmaker wouldn't exist in the future, but then the Rainmaker doesn't exist in the future, so future Bruce Willis has no reason to come back to kill the Rainmaker. So that's why it's a paradox for me. That just is unseparable. Sorry, Casey, keep going. 
You have officially blown my mind. <laughs> no, it's good. I, I really, that something similar to that, I, I can't remember, but it's all good. So the story is really good. I'll just say that so I can stop. Which like, is what Ryan Johnson wanted is like, exactly. stop picking apart the, the time travel and just enjoy the story for what it is. But and it's so much fun to pick apart the time travel. It is fun to pick apart the time travel. And like I said, it'll still, even though he said like, don't worry about it, I'll worry about it. And it'll be one of my <laughs> yeah. biggest nitpicks of the movie is that he has his rules, but the time right. travel did not do itself well. If you, like I said before, if you just take the time travel at face value for what's given to you in the movie and don't read too far into it, it creates a really cool story. Yeah. So I will say that for Ryan Johnson and for this story because it's amazing. The finale is amazing, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I mean, just yeah, so, perfect. Yeah. So after all this ha- ends up happening, um, old Joe starts going out looking for these little kids trying to get rid of the rainmaker uh young joe travels out to after okay so they fight in the diner and he ends up tearing a piece of the paper off with all the the addresses of these kids so he's got one address and he ends up going out to this farm and out at the farm he finds sarah working on the farm it's a cane field yeah like a sugar cane cane cane. farm yeah and she's living there with her little what six-year-old kid however old he is it's 10 right I don't think he's 10. He's younger than 10. And his name is Sid. Sid. And he is the best actor in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Not literally, but man, this kid's okay, stole the I was show scared. for me. Aside from that. Bruce no. Willis, you mean. Like, I know there's better actors in this, but this kid did such a good job in this role as Sid. He was so believable to me. Like, like he played these really mean, like... Um, just temper tantrums really believably and the way he interacted with uh the adults throughout the film was really believable and he came across smarter than a kid i know he was supposed to but he the way he acted it the kid acted it he came across smarter than a kid that age would be for me oh that kid was that kid was a genius he knows math better than i do and he made very (laughs) selective decisions what's really interesting about the farm part and young joe taking the map is he shows up and he just hides in the cane field for a few days and he starts this process of detoxing from all his drugs, right? He's on a come down and he just wrecks himself. Like he's just out there and he can't handle it. And Sarah goes out there the very first time he's there with a shotgun, describes accurately the gun that she has. And then's like, I am not afraid to kill you. And I thought that was pretty good. And then, you know, like this deaf guy comes running through the house, like with a sign on him. He's a mute, sorry, not a deaf guy, but a mute. And then, you know, Joe gets up and the next day, you know, she lets him sleep in the bar and the next day, you know, has the paper and everything like that, that describes everything, you know, and then she's like, what do you have this number for? Why do you have my house? Like all this type of stuff. He's like, it's not for you to know. Like, I'm just going to be here for a few days. It's none of your business. And I was like, what a cocky jerk. You're sitting on someone's property and you're just not going to be like, oh, there's this crazy guy who's probably coming to your house to kill you. And I'm just here as defense from the, if there is a government or something, you know, why don't make, make up a lie to start out with? But that's probably what I would do. I wonder do. if he was just worried that she'd sell him out mm. to to the uh, the gap men that are coming after him. Yeah. Which the gap men are like, there's the, there's the loopers and then the gap men are like the the enforcers the act, yeah the enforcers the people who actually go out and kill people face to face instead of killing someone with a bag over their head would it be harder to kill someone whose head was in a bag or face to face oh face to face oh face to face definitely why do you think that took you know joseph gordon levitt's character so young joe like a back when you know his old self came up and he was all arms outstretched with his head forward they make eye know. contact there exactly yeah that would make sense but like for instance if you become i'm sorry we got into this conversation but if you become used to something right it's normal but i bet he was just surprised you know taking the back you know but yeah it must i I, i've never killed anyone so this is (laughs) this is why i was like curious i'm like would it be harder to be a get man or would be harder Mm -hmm. to kill these people who don't know why you're killing them uh i can't remember if it was in one of the deleted episodes or in uh, a part of the movie but there's a scene that talks about who some of the gap men are like um boy blue uh he was a looper and they just it just kind of explains in passing but boy blue it was in one of the deleted episodes he was a looper and after he 
closed his loop. He wasted all of his money mm-hmm. and didn't have anything left. And so Abe uh, recruited him as a Gatman in order to be able to stay afloat and not have to live in poverty. So I, I feel like loopers are the ones who get to live this fancy, fancy lifestyle, and the Gatmen are just the enforcers who don't have anything left and are forced uh, and are forced into that life, lifestyle of being the bodyguards, the the killers. Huh. Okay. It's kind of an interesting side note. That that I I never would have thought about, and I didn't do enough research to, <laughs> to find out. But that would make a ton of sense because he. He would know. And then Sarah, she also knows about the loopers. Yeah. How does she know that? I feel like, okay, so this is weird. There, there's a scene where Joe and Sarah, they kind of get frisky, right? And then at the end, she's like, she's like talking through that scene. I expected it to be in there, like a Game of Thrones, like sex dialogue scene. And it, there wasn't enough. She just talks about her ability to hover the lighter around. And so, yeah, I'm still a little bit more curious, but she does talk about like meeting guys in the city and maybe she worked at the club that Abe runs, and maybe this kid comes from a looper. Maybe he is the byproduct of a looper. I'm sure she probably found out about loopers because loopers are one of you know society's best kept secret at that point. You know, with the whole people, you know, that most people in the world don't know that time time travel exists at that moment, right? Because it's invented in 30 years and it's illegal. But most people don't know it exists. Also, you have she's looking for more knowledge probably about her son because he has these crazy telekinetic powers right and so i think they're just maybe in that search for knowledge she stumbled kind of across i'm i'm saying i think this is no. just like a, a theory sense. about how she'd find that because i don't think that they explain it ever or really give us a concrete fact about how she finds that out yeah yeah well this kid the rainmaker right he he's such an interesting character and kind of Something that really fascinated me was is that Sarah is sticking with him despite his tantrums and his show of power, per se, show of force, right? So when the Gat men come and they come to pick up young Joe, this kid, like, at one point falls down the stairs, right? And it just, like, okay, so we see an earlier section of his power, which, you know, Sarah goes and hides in the gun safe. But then we get to this point where... There's this guy, the kid falls down the stairs, and Joe's, like, going over to pick him up and, like, coddle him, and Sarah just, like, football tackles him right out of the house. Well, because well, he's trying to catch him, because, you know, you have, like, a normal kid who would fall down the stairs like that. See, I was thinking it was going slow-mo because, like, the kid was going to die or something, you know? He was going to hit his head, and that's the way the future would be changed. And so it was obviously really confusing when you see Sarah football tackle him out of the way. I'm like to just let the kid fall down the stairs and do his thing it was so confusing but it was also a really smart way both that and then the scene that ensues with the kid lifting up like everything in the house and everything exploding just poof. it was a really smart way to show us that this kid can take it to the next level because earlier we were left a little bit confused because the kid starts yelling and you know it's a big temper tantrum and he pushed sarah and stuff but she goes and she runs and hides in this gun safe like you said and i was a little bit confused i was like you know it's like a seven eight year old kid like throwing a temper tantrum like it's not that big a deal like maybe like there's something in her past or something but we were left a little bit confused and then at this moment when she tackles him out of the way you already know something's up and then you just start seeing things being lifted and the biggest thing we've seen lifted so far is orders quarters and she does the lighter yeah right and so we don't really know much about anything else happening and so we see that happening and we see that it's the kid doing it and we're just like whoa this telekinesis like like i said i thought it was not a big deal i thought it was stupid to have it in the movie until we realized that this is why it's in the movie because this kid has these powers and that's why he makes such a big difference in the future Mm -hmm. and so he does this And it's just taken to the next level. Makes you understand how this myth of the Rainmaker who took out the entire mobs by himself was able to do it. Because he's got friggin' super mutant powers. He can just blow people up with his mind. (laughs) And this is when uh, young Joe finds out too. Like, oh, this guy, this kid is the Rainmaker and you knew this the whole time and you weren't going to tell me? And he has, he goes through this like, this crisis of do i kill this guy who's supposed to this kid who's supposed to grow up to be this terrible 
murdering kid or do I leave him alive and change the future? And this brings up something that we discussed in the I Am Mother episode a long time ago, the nature versus nurture thing. If the kid grows up with his mom, is he going to be okay and he's going to grow up to be this good person and it's going to be this happy future? Or will that make a difference at all? I just had a weird stroke of thought. Maybe it's a stupid thought. I don't know. But what if Sarah came back from the future to raise him? Because, right, his mom was his mom died when he was a baby. What if the Rainmaker kid, Sid, was an orphan? And that's what he became because he's like, you know about, like Joe freaks out. He's like, you knew. How did his mom die? How did this all happen? And she's like, but I'm going to raise him. I can change him. You know, he wasn't raised by me. So yeah, what so, if she came back originally and is hoping to change the future? That'd be interesting. Because she's not really his mom, right? Even though no, she, makes she up, is really his mom. She is really his yeah, mom. Yeah, it is kind of confusing the dialogue. Yeah, that can. That, it's like that. Yeah, the, all that dialogue. Because the kid like, keeps nah. saying like, "I know she's really not my mom. I remember my mom." But because she like but lived she in left. the city, right, and yeah. left the baby with and okay. Came back. But it, that's an interesting thought. Like, if this kid was a child of the future, mm-hmm. it would make sense why he is so much more powerful than everyone else. Yeah. And then it also could just be the progression because you see kid, people hold, float in quarters and then you see the progression of his mom floating the lighter even farther and wider around. Mm-hmm. It would make sense that he would be even more powerful. Either way, it's a cool theory. Yeah. Also, that book series I was talking about earlier is called the Steel Heart series. Sorry, I remembered it while we were thinking cool. about this. So, <laughs> Random yeah. remembrance moment. So this last 20 to 25 minutes of the movie is where it all comes together and for me it's what made the movie so that everything in the movie that i had doubted and that didn't make sense came together for you know the conclusion and everything is that this entire last 20 to 25 minutes you have the internal struggle of young joe's character of killing the raker killing the rainmaker versus not killing the rainmaker and what it will do for the future like you said the nature versus nurture thing because he's looking at it in a few different ways he says okay So I know that in the future, or at least the future that we have now, that old Joe has, this kid is going to grow up, be a mob boss, kill everyone. And now that he knows the things that he can do, like you said, he's thrown into this struggle. And so he is in an internal crisis for the entire last part of the movie, and he's debating killing the kid, not killing the kid, and the effects that will have on the future. It's a really hard thing for him because since he knows that what the kid has is so revolutionary and something that the world has never seen before, that it really is a bigger decision than like a decision of ethics with the little kid. But then it does come down to he chases the kid into the cane fields, and then when he gets there and he sees the kid just sitting down, he's a six-year-old kid again. You know, he's not this telekinetic monster that just destroyed this house killed this person he really is just a kid who doesn't know how to control everything and so even though him and sarah still debate about it i mean obviously in the conclusion he makes that final decision of what to do um he struggles with that the entire last part of the movie which i love it's beautiful Mm. it's perfect old joe turns into terminator starts (laughs) just coming for him seems to be this unstoppable force and they have this big showdown out in the cane fields where, uh, well, I guess Boy Blue comes over. They end up killing Boy Blue off. That was a super cool, like, that was a really cool death. Like, I, I always hate to say it like that, but that was a cool death. Because all Joe, young Joe, has is the blunderbuss, right? And he's just, like, shooting it, and it's it's not designed for distance. I think it's, like, 50 yards max or 50 feet max. At this oh, they say, shoot. like, way less than that. They're it's like, a, it's impossible to miss something that's, like, 10 feet in front of you, and they're like, it's impossible to hit anything, like, 20 feet past <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, so it's, like, a really close-range weapon, but then he realizes, oh, here's a great idea. He shoots the ground and, like, tears up the dust and smoke and stuff like that. So, what was it, Boy Blue comes through, and he just, like, on his, like, little floating motorbike back to the future motorbike and he shoots him offside i was like what a what a clever idea he's he's a good thinker that that young joe boy blue too is smarter than you think he's the one through the whole movie that keeps tracking down joe he finds him by tracking the bike to the diner that was his idea yeah he finds old joe by 
remembering that young Joe has a thing for one of the working girls. So he goes to her house and waits there for him to show up. And that's how they end up catching old Joe. And the problem is, though, he's 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 smarter than he looks, but he fails all the time. He's stupid at the same time, so he's, he keeps making sloppy mistakes. Yeah. And even down to the last minute, when he finally brings in old Joe, and he's like so proud of himself, all he wants to do is impress Abe and get get the good job from Abe, and he ends up being the ruin of the entire past mob because, like I said, old Joe gets free gets a couple machine guns and just goes Terminator on all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Becomes this unstoppable force and just wipes out the entire mob. That was a really great scene for me when, you know, you had old Joe just going through the entire building and just taking out everyone, you know. The body count was just piling up into the 20s, maybe the 30s. I don't know. It was going crazy. There was one part, though, where I saw Bruce Willis and he had the guns. He's like two, like, P90-looking things, and he was just going... And it was really awesome, but then there was a scene where it just showed his face, like, shooting the P90s, and he was, like, yelling, and it was, like, weird. I was, like, <laughs> this isn't, like, diehard Bruce Willis. This, like, doesn't make sense just for that one scene, because the whole <laughs> the whole scene, I loved it. Just for that one shot, though, kind of like, weird. he was yelling, and he had, like, this weird, like, underbite thing where you could only see his bottom teeth. He was, like, ah, and I was, like, just taking it back for a second. Did you see his old man face I didn't, shaking, too? I didn't. <laughs> I just didn't like that shot. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not like trying to like nitpick. I was just saying that that was something that took me aback because it was really, really weird. Can just you that imagine one... being one of the guys at the, end of the other end of the barrel seeing that coming at you? True, that would be... <laughs> That'd be terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes my underbite. <laughs> so old Joe ends up killing his mentor, the guy who recruited him into the loopers, Abe, who, you know, hats off to Jeff Daniels, man. He did a good job playing the mob boss. He nailed it. Because like I said, when I first saw it, I was like, oh man, dumb and dumber. But by the end, you respect him. legit mob man. Mm-hmm. So respect. Respect, then, Jeff Daniels. And then uh, old Joe comes for the kid, the last person on his list. And that's when he ends up killing Boy Blue, like we talked about. And then they have this giant standoff in the field where young Joe has this final decision to make. You know, does he stop old Joe from like, like, okay, he sees it all. Like he does the voiceover and he, he sees everything that's about to unfold and he realizes that what's going on. He's in a loop himself mm-hmm. that in my, in my mind, going back to the time travel thing, you know, it's kind of like Terminator three. It's like, no matter what you do, the apocalypse is still going to happen. And so Joe is stuck in this loop of no matter what they've done the rainmaker still gets made Mm -hmm. and he has to he ends up like deciding like i see the loop i see the kid that's about to lose his mom who's going to become the rainmaker who's going to start killing people who's going to force old joe to come back and we're going to just going to keep doing this and doing this and doing this forever so it ends with that final line that he stopped it he kills himself what what does he say there he's like I see like a, a mother prepared to die for his child, her child, a man who would die for his wife and a child who will become like an orphan and take revenge yeah. on the world. Right. What a powerful like thought process to go through. I never, I don't think I've ever thought that deeply about, okay, this car accident, it was a man who was texting on his phone who hit a car who, which had a, you know, a son going to his first prom who will now no longer go and this is like this deep thing and he makes that decision right it's like a well calculated and he's like and i've got to end it and i've got to change it right he says something like that and boom you just see it and then all of a sudden bruce willis old joe whew, gone and that was a that was a kind of a crazy beautiful moment holy cow man i freaked like i was in my bedroom just finishing this movie today after work before you know, I did other stuff and came over for the podcast and I freaked. It was one of those hands on my head moments. <laughs> my mouth was wide open and I freaked out. And after I thought about it, I realized that like Casey said, it was because of the setup. Everything that they've done in the movie to set up this shocking moment was perfect. So that final monologue really did encapsulate the entire movie. Mm-hmm. And he talked about the loop. And so just like Casey said, is that you got Joseph Gordon-Levitt, the young Joe looking in and he's saying that even though old Joe is trying to end this, he's like, he's the one who's causing it. He's instigating everything. And so it was just, you know, because it got really slow. You had Emily Blunt, Sarah, standing in front of her son. You had old Joe trying to get to him. 
And so he just said, just like Casey said, I'm not trying to reiterate it. It's just that trying to emphasize it because of how amazing it was put together. That whole part, I was feeling it. I had chills because I was watching it. And he's like, I just, he's like, wow. He's like, now that we've gotten to this moment, I see how it happens. And like I talked about before, he's in that internal struggle of what will he do? And at this point, he knows what he has to do. And it wasn't either of the things before. It wasn't killing the kid or not killing the kid. I mean, it is not killing the kid, right? But it's something that's not necessarily just strictly one of those two options. Because before, that's what all it was. Like, the Rainmaker existing, the Rainmaker not existing. But he gets to this moment and he sees, this is how the Rainmaker comes to be. It wasn't our decision before. It wasn't, oh, like, just killing the kid or not. It's, the kid has gone through this traumatic experience. The mom's going to get shot. The Rainmaker, the kid, is going to feel so bad about it. Just want to seek revenge no matter what. And so he's like, this is the moment right now that's going to cause everything. And so he's in this internal crisis, and he says, this is the climax of it. He's like, what are we going to do to stop this? We need a good future. I don't want to be like that in the future. I've got to change it. Boom. (sighs) I know. (laughs) Like I said, everything building up to this moment made it worth it for me. There were a lot of things that I had problems with during the movie, both with the time travel and the different buildups. Um, but then this moment, I just was blown away. And it was perfect for me. And it made, like I said, everything worth it. It made the entire story arc with him narrating again at the very end totally make sense and just blow me away. Just like him in a dark humor sort of way. It blew me <laughs> away. And that's it. Oh. Such a cool movie. I'm so happy we did this well, one. Well, what did you guys think? Just really quick, sorry, because they do that and it blows them away. I thought it was just going to roll credits right there. Uh-huh. Like at the very end, it shows like a couple more shots of like the kid and his mom like going on and living. What did you guys think like that had as far as meaning for the story? Just that the Rainmaker wasn't going to exist or anything That's happened? like the hardest part right there for me is because... He doesn't know that it's still not going to, this kid's not going to turn out bad. He's giving the mom a chance, right? That she can hopefully help this guy out and help this kid grow. But what I thought was a beautiful way that Emily Blunt's character kind of segued it so that like Joe wasn't the bad guy, that Joe saved him so that loopers would have a good impression on him was that he's like, where's Joe? And he, and she's like, he had to go away. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that there was other questions or dialogue that happened outside of that. But what we're operating on is we don't know that this kid still isn't going to turn out to be a, a villain of some sort. But we do know that now Emily Blunt's character, Sarah, has the chance to raise this kid to be better than he potentially became. And she, you even get a glimpse of the hope in it when Sid, the kid throws that tantrum at the very end in the field and she's whispering to him calm down everything's fine i love you i'm here for you and it gives you that and i think it gave joe that moment too of like clarity like things will be different if she's around and it gave him the hope it gives us the hope as the audience that with her there the future is brighter because that's why he did it right because in his version of the future sarah got killed and like I said, the kid, he survived because he made it to the cane fields, but he just becomes an orphan. Lives and on that's... the streets with this vendetta. Exactly, and that's what the loop is. Mm-hmm. So for him, he believes, even though we don't specifically know, he believes that with Sarah and what she's able to do, she will be that difference. Because in this version of the timeline, you know, she ceases to exist. She yeah. dies. So I think that even though we don't specifically know, I think we can hope, like Joe did, that what he did ends up for the better, that this Rainmaker will hopefully not even just not become a mob boss, but maybe even improve the world in yeah, the future. Yeah, something good with the power that he has. So I like I like the extra scenes in it. I think it could have ended just fine with that big moment, but... I liked it. Yeah, I thought it worked well. To give us this conversation, you know, just a little bit of extra thought mm-hmm. about the consequences of the movie and not just that it ends on that yeah. scene. Yeah. And like, oh, that's crazy. But then, like, what happens after? Like, did he accomplish his purpose? Yeah. So those are our thoughts on Loopers. Do you guys have any last thoughts you want to add? <laughs> I was waiting Whispered just to say. I was just ears. actually waiting to say ditto, but there was nothing to ditto <laughs> at this point. Did, did you love it? Ditto. Ditto. Wait, what? Ditto. Ditto, ditto, ditto. 
Well, cool. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, that's been our Looper episode. Uh, follow us on Instagram. I'm over there posting consistently at the Pause Rewind Play podcast. Sorry, Pause Rewind Play podcast. Is that what it is? Yeah, at Pause Rewind Play podcast. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I I had a little my mind space brain fart. Yep. So follow us over on Instagram. We're con- like we're we're actually having pretty fun conversations um, from everything from recent trailers being released to the movie that we'll be talking that we just did episodes about so jump over and uh talk with us it's a lot of fun josh we got next week's movie right oh yeah next week's movie you want to go ahead and announce that yeah so we're super excited for next week to be picking apart the brand new film from the one and only quentin tarantino once upon a time in hollywood so be looking for that next week. We're super excited. And also, like Vince said, with the Instagram, check us out there. Check us out on Twitter at Pause Rewind PLA. Also having those fun conversations over there. So it's a really nice community. We love hearing from you guys. Let us know what you want. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks. It's been fun.